Boldwood presents The Hat Girl of Silver Street Written by Lindsay Hutchinson And read by Charlie Sanderson The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood For my friend Diane Cooper Who bolsters me with sisterly love whenever it is needed Chapter 1 Ella Bancroft looked down at the tangled mess in her fingers and stifled a sob. She pulled at the ruined hat in an effort to rectify her error, but the steaming process had set the blunder in place. A tear slipped from her eye and rolled down her cheek. This was her second mistake in a week. Her first was sticking her finger with a pin and leaving a blood spot on a piece of white tool. Ivy had ranted and raved as she had snipped off the offending piece of material to rescue the hat. Now, Ella had spoilt the crown of a felt winter hat, having steamed it into the wrong shape entirely. Thinking quickly, she wondered whether, if she held it over the steamer again, she could reform it. About to try, Ella caught her breath as she heard footsteps on the bare wooden staircase. It was too late. Ivy was on her way up. Ella had been employed at Ivy Gladwin's shop for two years, and yet suddenly she had begun making errors. Why? Was it because she was unhappy in her work? How are you getting on with that order? Ivy called as she entered the bedroom, which had been converted to a workroom. Um, I... Ella mumbled, as she looked again at the floppy felt monstrosity. What the... Ivy gasped, snatching the article from Ella. She held it up between thumb and forefinger. How on earth? Good grief, girl. Can't you do anything right? The sob Ella was holding back escaped her lips. I'm sorry, Miss Gladwin. I don't know what happened. Neither do I, Ivy snapped, throwing the felt onto the table. It's completely ruined. An expensive piece of material at the outset, and now it's a... Oh, do stop snivelling! The sharp slap to her cheek caused Ella to catch her breath, and she raised a hand to cover the stinging skin. Ella sniffed and tried hard to halt the sobs racking her body. I, I'm really sorry, she managed at last. Well, you will have to pay for it out of your wages. Now start again and for God's sake mind what you're doing. With that, Ivy strode from the room, her long bombazine skirt swishing against her side-button boots. Ella stared at the hat on the table and thought about the last two years of her life. She had seen the advert in the local newspaper for an apprentice hat-maker. Having applied and been interrogated by Miss Gladwin for over an hour, she was given the post on a month's trial. The pay, she was told, would be one pound and ten shillings a week, but she must work a week in hand first. Any damages would be taken out of her money before she received it. Now she was halfway through this week, and already there would be two stoppages from her salary. Ella sighed as she worked out just how much she would have in her hand come Friday. The gold flecks in her hazel eyes were accentuated as more tears brimmed before falling. Pushing a stray dark curl from her forehead, Ella moved to the workbench. With a sniff and a sigh, she began her work again, this time selecting the correct block to steam the material over. Ella thought once more about her earnings. Would there be enough to feed herself and her father? The food in the larder was running desperately low, and she knew if there was only enough for one of them to eat, she would make sure it was her dad. Thomas Bancroft had worked all his life at the Cyclops Tube Works until he was crippled in an accident three years before. The steel tubes, not having been secured properly in their cradle, had rolled down with a thunderous crash and trapped Thomas's legs. When he was eventually freed, the hospital had told him he would never walk or work again, the bones in his legs having been completely shattered. He was lucky to have survived the devastating accident. Thomas took it very hard in the beginning, but with love and care from his youngest daughter, he had slowly come to terms with his disability, or so Ella thought. 
Ella's mind moved to her mother, who had died eight years previously, when Ella was only ten years old, and her sister, Sally, was twelve. It had been a terrible blow to them all. Trying her best to earn a few coppers here and there, Ella had taken in washing. Now she was in full-time employment, but for how long? She always felt as though she was still on probation, and she knew that if she made any more mistakes she'd be out on her ear. Having spread the material over the block, Ella picked up her thimble and began to insert the blocking pins. Thick and strong, they were hard to push into the wooden block, and before long her fingers ached with the strain. Then she steamed the hat and sighed with satisfaction. It had turned out all right this time. Suddenly the door flew open and Ivy marched into the room. So intent was she on her work that Ella had not heard her coming. Peering closely at the new felt on its block, Ivy nodded. You can go home now, it's gone seven o'clock. Seven? It was late. Normally finishing at six, Ella realised her father would be frantic. He would be hungry too. Snatching her coat from the stand in the corner, Ella said her good night and rushed out into the cold, dark night. January 1900 was a very cold month, with snow and bitter winds. The little town of Warsaw, in the heartland of the black country, saw burst standpipes as the weather thawed before freezing again. Those fortunate enough to have water piped to the house were no better off. Hailstones the size of florins hammered down, sending folk scattering in search of shelter. With her head down against the icy blast of wind, Ella left Junction Street and headed for her two-up, two-down home in Silver Street. The district, although spelled called more, was pronounced karma, and it consisted of small houses tightly packed together. Out on the flanks of the town was where the industry was situated, iron and tube works, galvanising plants, foundries, sawmills and brickworks. A little further afield lay massive sprawls of heathland, dotted with disused coal pits. The waterworks reservoir sat in the centre of the scrubland. Walsall Union Workhouse stood nearby as if to serve as a reminder to all that one day it could be them hovering at the gate, waiting for admittance. Stepping carefully on the snow-covered icy cobbles, Ella walked as fast as she dared. It wouldn't do to fall and break a leg or an arm, she had her father to see to. Walking through the darkness, lit only by occasional pools of light from the gas street lamps, Ella was eager to be home. Her long coat kept her legs warm, and Ella pulled her shawl tighter around her shoulders with gloved hands. The cold nipped her nose, and as she exhaled, the breath showed in a ghostly plume. Entering through the back door, she called out, Dad, I'm home! Where on earth have you been? I was worried to death, came the answer as Thomas dragged his wheeled bath chair into the kitchen by grasping the doorway. I'm sorry, but Miss Gladwin kept me late, Ella said as she hurriedly removed her coat and shawl, hanging them on the nail in the back door. Placing her bag on the table, she took off her hat and set it on top. Why? Hello to you too, Sally, Ella answered her sister's question. Sally, two years older than Ella, was married to Edward Denton and lived not far away in Cross Street. In contrast to her sibling, Sally was plain-faced with mousy brown hair. Her spiteful nature was well known, and her lazy, good-for-nothing husband was no better. Bequeathed the house by his parents, Eddie was slowly squandering the little money left to him and considered working for a living quite beneath him. Thomas watched his girl setting a pot of leftover broth on top of the range to heat through. We have a fussy client, and Miss Gladwin wanted everything to be just right, Ella replied. It was not a lie, but it was not the whole truth either. Cutting some fresh bread, she kept her eyes on the gully, for fear of slicing a finger open. Did you mess up again? Sally asked sharply. Ella ceased sawing at the bread and nodded, not daring to look at her father. Put that down and come over here. Tell your old dad all about it. Thomas held out his arms and Ella rushed into them and fell to her knees, great sobs heaving from her chest. 
Thomas patted her back gently for a moment, whispering comforting words. It'll be all right, gal, you'll see. Just do your best, and no one can ask any more than that. Ella cried out her self-pity and frustration, then dried her tears. Thanks, Dad. Sally had watched the little scene with scorn written all over her face. You need to grow a backbone, she said nastily. Don't you ever have anything better to do than come here every day and pick flies? Ella asked sternly. I'll come to look after Dad while you're out at work, Sally said indignantly. You what? You only come to drink tea and gossip? Ella was suddenly furious at Sally's attitude. The girl never lifted a finger to help. Ella did it all. She worked, cleaned, cooked, washed and ironed, as well as saw to their crippled father. Enough, girls, Thomas intervened before the situation got out of hand. Sally, it's time you went home to your husband. Sally snorted and grabbed her coat. Giving Thomas a peck on the cheek, she left the house without another word. While Stella served up their meal, she explained her mistake with the hat. Miss Gladwin was furious with me, she said. That's because she's a dried-up old hag, Thomas said with a cheeky grin. Dad! Ella scolded, but couldn't help the smile creeping across her face. She said I'll have to pay out of my wages. It don't matter, sweetheart, we'll manage. Thomas shook his head, then continued to eat his broth. While Stella washed the dishes and prepared her father's lunch for the following day, Thomas made his way in his wheelchair to the sitting room, which had been converted to a bedroom after his accident. About to knock on his door, Ella stopped and listened. Inside she could hear Thomas berating himself. Peeping around the door, which stood ajar, Ella covered her mouth with a hand. Thomas was pounding his thin legs as he cursed their uselessness. Stupid bloody legs. Why won't you damn well work? They should have cut you off when I was in the hospital, because you're no use to me now. Returning to the kitchen, Ella swallowed tears that were threatening to erupt yet again. She dallied as she made a cup of tea, allowing her father time to undress and drag himself into bed. Taking his tea, Ella knocked before entering his room. I thought you might like a cuppa. Oh, lovely. You're a good girl to me, Thomas said as he accepted the cup. Patting the bed, he went on. Sit a minute. Ella smiled and perched on the end of the bed. I don't want you to let that woman get you down, Thomas began. You're clever. And everybody makes mistakes sometimes, so promise me now you won't worry any more. Ella nodded with a smile. Tomorrow's another day. Go in there with a new attitude. Be confident and don't take any nonsense from that baggage. Thomas grinned wickedly and looked pleased to see his girl smile. That's better. Now you get some sleep, my lovely. Ella kissed his cheek and went upstairs to bed. Thomas reached for the little white pills the doctor had given him for the pains in his chest and swallowed one with his tea. The doctor had explained that his heart was weak and being in the wheelchair all the time was not helping. There was nothing to be done about that, but all Thomas could do was continue taking his medication regularly. He still tried to keep his ailment a secret from Ella by asking Mrs Woolley, his neighbour, to collect his tablets from the doctor, which, luckily, she was happy to do. Upstairs, Ella's room was cold, and she quickly poured a little water from a large jug into its accompanying bowl and swilled her face. The freezing water stung her skin, and she gasped, before grabbing her towel and rubbing her cheeks hard to warm them. Frantically, she undressed, threw on a voluminous cotton nightgown, and climbed into bed. Her teeth chattered as she pulled the eider down up to her nose. Gradually, the warmth wrapped itself around her, and she began to relax for the first time that day. She watched the light from the moon filter through the lacy, patterned frost covering the window, casting strange shadows on the wall. Staring at the frosted pane, she considered. She was so lucky to have such a good father. She knew how his legs made him feel, how they emasculated him. There was nothing she could do about that but she could continue to love and care for him. She had a roof over her head and food in her belly, which was more than a lot of people had, 
those who lived on the streets, for instance. She had a job, too, for which she was grateful, but she did wish her employer would be a little kinder to her. Recalling her father's words, she determined she would take more care and work harder, giving Miss Gladwin no reason to be harsh with her. With drooping eyelids, Ella finally succumbed to sleep. Chapter 2 At seven o'clock on the dot, Ella entered the shop. Good morning, Miss Gladwin. Ivy nodded and said, I hope you're ready to get it right today. Please tell me you remember where I told you to place the flowers and feathers on that hat. She nodded to the felt Ella had been working on the previous day. Ella nodded. As she took off her coat and hung it up, she thought... I've been here two minutes and this woman has already sucked the energy right out of me. Gathering the things she needed, Ella trudged upstairs, settled on her stool at the table and threaded a needle ready to start work. Ivy stood watching, a frown creasing her brow and her hands on her hips. She was dressed in a brown suit, the jacket nipped into her already slim waist. The skirt fell to highly polished boots. Her Titian hair was piled on her head beautifully, and her pale blue eyes held a hardness which never softened. Her skin was milky white and had recently begun to show its age. Satisfied her apprentice was concentrating, Ivy went downstairs to the shop. She had decided to change the display in the window, and so she started by pulling out the hats already on show. Boxing them up, she placed them on a shelf in the back room. Grabbing a rag, she dusted down the window before looking at the new range and deciding which to choose. Picking up a cinema cartwheel in the light chocolate colour, Ivy ran her fingers over the huge white ostrich feather. She inspected the silk roses of the same pure white for any faults or flaws. Having made them herself, she knew it was unlikely there would be any. She nodded and placed the hat on a stand in the centre of the window. It was striking and would draw the eye, she thought. Ivy smiled, certain it would sell quickly. Next, she chose a black felt winter hat, covered with pink silk roses. Then came a black silk gentleman's top hat, beside which she laid a silver-topped cane and a pair of soft napper gloves. Behind the cartwheel hat, she propped up an open white broderie on glaze parasol. Working quietly, Ivy Gladwin hoped her window would bring a touch of class to the drab little town, which was still covered in a blanket of snow. Upstairs, Ella snipped the cotton, having put in her final stitches. She turned the hat this way and that, admiring her work. She had done a good job, even if she said so herself. She just hoped Miss Gladwin would think so too. Tidying her workbench, she glanced at the tin clock on the mantelpiece, mid-morning, it had taken three hours to complete her project. Now it was time for tea, so she made her way downstairs. I thought you might be ready for this, Ella said, proffering the cup and saucer. Thank you, said Ivy, taking the beverage and placing it on the counter. Stand in the window area while I view it from outside. It may need adjustment, although I sincerely doubt it. Grabbing a thick woollen shawl, Ivy stepped out onto the cobblestones, which were slick with ice, and gazed at her handiwork. A moment later, she was back indoors. It's fine as it is, but then I knew it would be. Picking up her cup, she asked, How did you get on with that order? It's all finished, Ella said with a small amount of pride. I'll drink this, Ivy held up her cup, then I'll come and inspect it. The two drank their tea in silence before climbing the stairs to the workroom. Ella passed the hat to Ivy, who took great lengths to examine the stitches. Then, with a nod, she said, Right, box and label it. I have a parasol which needs a lacy trim attaching, something even you can't make a mess of. Ella winced at the comment and watched Ivy pull open the long drawer beneath the work counter. Taking out a white umbrella, she thrust it at the girl. Let me know when it's done. Shoving the drawer shut, Ivy left the room. With a sigh, Ella collected the lace trim and picked up an already threaded needle. Would it have hurt Miss Gladwin to say, well done? A simple word of praise was all Ella wanted, but no, clearly it was too much to ask. Knowing she had done a good job was one thing, but being told was another entirely. 
Pinning the lace in place around the edge of the parasol, Ella snipped off the end before sewing it in place. Her eyes returned to the hat still lying on the counter. I'd better box that before Poison Ivy comes back, she thought. Immediately she berated herself for being so unkind to the woman who was her employer. Placing the hat in a box, she pinned the label on and tied it with string, then returned to the umbrella. The fire was low in the hearth, but Ella ignored it. She was working with white lace and couldn't risk smudging it with coal dust if she fed the embers. That would have to be her next task. Whilst Ella was endeavouring to keep her stitches as small as possible, her father was sitting in his wheelchair, staring out of the kitchen window. There was little to see. A tiny patch of waste ground and the privy block. But Thomas's eyes didn't register either. His mind had, like so many times before, taken him back to his accident. Unconsciously he winced as he recalled the excruciating pain he felt once the steel tubes had been removed from his shattered legs. Although he no longer suffered the agony, the memory was all too real. Looking down at his thin, bony knees, Thomas sucked in a breath, desperately trying to stem his tears. Black countrymen didn't cry, he told himself. Born and bred to be strong and fearless, the men of Warsaw worked hard all their lives to provide for their families. For Thomas Bancroft, however, there would be no more work. Raising his eyes to the window once more, he wondered, was this all that was left to him? Would he die in his wicker chair? Could he ever be useful again? Thomas hated the fact that he had become a burden to his daughters. At eighteen years old, Ella should be enjoying her life, not looking after her crippled father. At least Sally was married, even if it was to Eddie Denton. Thomas had never liked that young man, but Sally had fallen in love and so he had relented, agreeing to the wedding. His eldest daughter continued to visit three or four times a week. Although he enjoyed seeing her, he often wished she would curb her acidic tongue, especially where Ella was concerned. Sibling rivalry was common, he knew that, but there was jealousy, too, which had carried through from their earliest years. The old saying referring to children sprang to mind. You never get two the same, which in this case was true. Sally, ordinary looking with a spiteful nature and a sharp tongue, which she could never keep behind her teeth, and Ella, pretty as a picture with a loving and kind nature. He loved them both, there was no denying that, but he wished they would cease their constant bickering. As his thoughts roamed, his hand went subconsciously to his chest to rub at the pains he had learned to live with. So many times he had considered joining his wife in the afterlife, but the thought of his girls had brought him to his senses. With each day that passed, Thomas knew his depression was growing deeper and keeping it from Ella was taking its toll. He worried that one day he might succumb and take his own life. Thomas Bancroft, you need to find something to do. Stop moping about and make yourself useful again. But it was easier thought than done. He was stuck in this chair, unable to get out and about by himself. There had to be a way of finding a job that didn't need the use of his legs. His upper body was strong from pushing and pulling the chair around. So maybe he could do some work with his hands? Suddenly... Thomas realised he was thinking positively for the first time in a very long while. Picking up the newspaper, he looked for anyone who might be hiring staff. There was nothing. And feeling despondent again, he pushed the paper across the table. The only thing he was good for was peeling the potatoes for their evening meal. Covering his face with his hands, Thomas finally let go of his pent-up frustration, anger and sadness. He wept as though his heart was breaking. That evening, as father and daughter ate their faggots and potatoes, Ella instinctively picked up on Thomas's mood. What's wrong, Dad? Thomas shook his head, but Ella persevered. Come on, I know when there's something amiss. You always taught me to share my problems, thereby halving them. Pushing his empty plate away, Thomas took a breath. 
You work so hard to keep the wolf from the door, and what do I do? Nothing. I sit around all day feeling sorry for myself. Ella, I have to find a job, or at the very least a hobby. Ella was surprised at the emotional outburst, and then she said, I can understand that. I suppose you've scoured the paper. Yes, there's now doing, Thomas replied sadly. Dad, what about the harness manufacturer? Maybe they'll have some work, Ella said with encouragement. How will I get there? This bloody chair is too big for a cab. Besides, it will be too dear to travel that way every day. Thomas shook his head, feeling the despair settling on him once more. I wonder if they employ outworkers, Ella mused. I could call in and ask on your behalf if you'd like. It wouldn't hurt, I suppose, Thomas answered with a grim smile. I'll go after work tomorrow. Fingers crossed they'll have something for you. Now you get to bed and I'll bring you a nice cuppa. Ella watched her father struggle his way through the doorway before closing her eyes. Please, God, let there be a job for my dad. I promise not to ask for anything more. Then she made the tea, hoping against hope that her dad would be employed before too long. Chapter 3 The following evening, Thomas tried his best to hide his disappointment. Ella had broken the news gently that there was no work to be had, even for an able-bodied man. Now, he watched his daughter practising tying a neat bow with a length of ribbon. Time after time she endeavoured to get it right, and in the end she slammed it on the table in frustration. I'll make some tea she said, placing clean cups on the table. She stared in astonishment at Thomas's deft fingers, producing a perfect bow. How? she gasped. Pulling the ribbon ends, the bow unravelled. Watch carefully, he said, and again a bow appeared in an instant. That's amazing, Ella said. I had no idea you could do that. Neither did I, Thomas said. Now you try. Ella beamed her pleasure when her bow matched her father's. There you go, it's easy once you know how, he said. I still have to master pleats, Ella answered with a grimace. Thomas pulled out his handkerchief and passed it to her. Show me. Ella did her best, but her pleating was uneven and messy. Fetch your pins, Thomas said as he took back the large square of cotton. Right, try it like this. Ella watched with fascination as Thomas folded the material into a fan, pinning it as he went. Dad, you should have been a milliner, Ella said at last. Your turn, Thomas said. Ella quickly grasped the idea, laughing at how simple it was. It warmed Thomas's heart to hear his daughter giggle. It had been a long time in coming. Ella locked up for the night, banked up the fire in her father's room and went to bed. She lay thinking about what she'd learned in a couple of hours spent with her dad. Then a thought struck. What if Miss Gladwin could hire Thomas to make the bows and silk flowers which would adorn her range of hats? It would have to be outwork, for he couldn't manage the stairs to the workroom. As she considered the idea further, Ella's excitement grew. She could bring home the haberdashery for Thomas to assemble and take the finished articles back the following day. Her father could earn a wage and feel useful again, and Miss Gladwin would have perfect attachments for her hats. It was a win-win situation as far as Ella was concerned. Now all she had to do was broach the idea with her employer. That same evening, Sally had raised the subject yet again of Eddie finding a job. I ain't working, he said. If anything, folks should be working for me. That's not likely, seeing as you have no business, Sally retorted. You should have used that money your folks left you to buy into a little going concern instead of piddling it up the walls of every boozer in the town. Don't start, Sal. I've told you before I'm considering my options, Eddie replied, giving the newspaper he was reading a shake. Your options? <laughs> what are they? Whether we starve or not because you're too lazy to get off your arse and work. Sally flicked her fingers against the paper held up in front of her husband's face. Give over, Sal, he muttered. Then, laying his reading material in his lap, he said, Anyway, 
It won't matter, because when your dad's gone, we can sell his house and we'll be in the money. What about our Ella? Sally asked. She'll have to rent a room somewhere, Eddie replied with a shrug. I suppose she could, but the problem there is they rent the house. Oh, bugger, I forgot about that. So, Mr Cleverclogs, you'll have to find another way to bring in some money. For God's sake, woman, give it a rest. Eddie picked up the paper once again as a grinning Sally set the kettle to boil for their evening cocoa. Ivy Gladwin was reading the newspaper when Ella arrived at the shop early the next morning. There's been an outbreak of influenza in London, Ivy said. I hope he doesn't come here. It's possible. After all, people travel more these days. It would only take one person, Ella responded. You're a little ray of sunshine this morning, Ivy cut her off. I was just saying, Ella defended herself. Again, Ivy interrupted. The British soldiers are still fighting in what they're calling the Second Boer War. Ella chose not to answer for fear of being shouted down again. Instead, she picked up a length of red ribbon and began to tie a bow like her father had shown her. Ivy watched from the corner of her eye as Ella laid the completed article on the table. You've been practising, she said. Yes. Miss Gladwin, can I ask you something? Receiving a curt nod, Ella proceeded. My father showed me how to do this. She picked up the bow again, and I was wondering, would it be possible for... Spit it out, girl, for goodness sake! Ivy's patience quickly ran out. Could you give my dad a job making bows and decorations? Ella's words came in a rush. Ivy's mouth dropped open as she stared at her young apprentice. Then, folding the paper neatly, she slapped it on the table. Why, pray tell, can your father not go out and find a job like other men? He had an accident in the tube works and now he's confined to a wheelchair, Ella answered sadly. I see. Well, that's a shame, Ella, but I can't possibly afford to take on another worker. Besides, having a man work here, a cripple no less, is completely out of the question. Ivy's words were sharp and her eyes glittered like cracked ice in the grey light of the morning. Please, Miss Gadwin. I could take the ribbons home and Dad could make them into bows. Then I could bring them back the next day. Ella pushed her point. I don't have the funds to pay and I'm sure your father would be horrified at the idea of working for a woman. Ivy retaliated. He wouldn't mind if it meant he was being of use again. The answer is no, Ella. Now let that be an end to it. We have a lot of work to get through today, so I suggest you make a start. The underside of the brim of Mrs Swallow's hat needs pleating, and please ensure you do it properly. Ivy got to her feet and marched from the room. Ella swallowed her tears as she picked up the white silk and began. Downstairs, Ivy was still in shock at being asked to employ a man, let alone one who could not walk. She realised she knew next to nothing about her employee. But then the girl's life outside of work was not her concern. Busying herself by arranging a straw boater on a pupae, a linen-covered wooden head form, Ivy couldn't get the conversation out of her mind. Yesterday, Ella couldn't tie a decent bow to save her life, and yet this morning she had tied one perfectly. She found herself wondering what else Mr Bancroft could do. It would be most unusual, but the man could have a natural artistic flair, in which case he might well be an asset to her business. Maybe he would have some new ideas, too, which could be taken into consideration. The pros and cons of the notion waged war in her mind all morning as she worked, tidying and dusting. Just before lunch, a young woman entered the shop and looked around. May I help you? Ivy asked, painting a smile on her face. I was looking for something a little more modern, the woman said. In which style? Ivy bristled. Riding hats. Ivy nodded and, pushing the ladder on its rollers along the shelves, she stood on the bottom rung. Pulling out a small hat box, she stepped down and placed it on the counter before removing the lid.
Lifting the hat from its resting place, she held it up for the woman to see. Hmm, not quite what I had in mind. The woman frowned and shook her head. I don't like all this drapery. Her fingers played with dangling ribbons and massive feathers. It's not really a proper riding hat, is it? Looks like someone went a bit mad with the decorating of it. No, I'll leave it, thank you. The woman gave a grim smile and left the shop. Ivy glanced down at the hat sitting on the counter. She had thought it one of her finest creations, but the woman had sneered at her efforts. Snatching up the offending article, she marched upstairs. I want all this lot taken off, Ivy said as she threw the hat onto the table. Why? Ella asked innocently. Because I said so. I don't have to explain myself to you, Ivy yelled. Then stomped from the room. Ella sighed. Ivy was in a foul mood. Was it to do with being asked to employ Thomas, or had something else happened? Either way, it would pay Ella to keep her mouth closed and follow orders. Deciding to finish the pleating task first, before unpicking the stitches to release the decor of the other hat, Ella resumed her work quietly. Mid-afternoon, Ivy arrived in the workroom, just as Ella had taken the last feather from the so-called riding hat. What do you want doing with this now? Ella asked. Hmm. Ivy could not envisage how the item should look in its final state. What would you suggest? Ella was surprised at being asked for her opinion. Was Ivy at a loss, and so moving the onus onto her assistant? I would simply tie a length of soft net around the crown, leaving the ends to fall to the back. I really think that's all it needs, Ella said tentatively. Ivy nodded as Ella completed the task. Boxing the hat, Ivy left to place it in the shop. An hour later, Ella heard the bell tinkle, and, having little to do, she crept to the top of the stairs. Listening to the conversation taking place between customer and vendor, Ella's mouth dropped open. I really think that's all it needs. Ivy was using the exact same words Ella had spoken earlier. The woman was taking credit for Ella's idea. Tiptoeing back to her stool, Ella seethed. She made up her mind there and then that she would be keeping her mouth firmly shut in future. Any notions she had regarding hat design or decoration, she would be keeping to herself. Another happy customer? Ivy said as she breezed into the room. Ella ignored the remark as she collected up the blocking pins and stored them away. On to the next, Ivy muttered happily as she checked the order book. Chapter 4 When Ella arrived home that night, she was horrified at the mess in the kitchen. Wood chippings and shavings littered the floor, and on the table sat two blocks rounded to perfection. Thomas was busily working shaping a larger one. Dad, what on earth? I've made these for you, to practice on, her father said proudly. Do you think I need practice? Ella asked. No, sweetheart, I should have chosen my words more carefully. I meant to say, to work with. Ella and Thomas grinned at each other as she stroked the wooden headforms. How did you get the wood? Ella asked as she fed the range after hanging up her coat. Mrs Woolley next door. She came calling and asked her to fetch some offcuts from the sawmill on Midland Road. Thomas answered. They would have been heavy to carry, Ella said, stroking her hand over one of the blocks. Muscles like a navvy, that one. Thomas laughed. Where did you get the money from? Mrs Woolley bullied the foreman and got them free, I believe. Thomas grinned. For the first time in years, Ella saw enthusiasm light her father's eyes. Are you pleased? Thomas asked. Oh, Dad, I'm thrilled, thank you. Ella flung her arms around Thomas's shoulders and kissed the top of his head. Sweeping up the debris, Ella threw it into the fire in the range. This one is for men's top hats, and those, he pointed to the table, are for ladies. I can make more if you need them. I think these will be enough, thank you. But I would need a pew pie too. Ella explained about the padded head block covered in linen. Not a problem, Thomas grinned. 
I'll sort that out for you tomorrow. What else will you need? Blocking pins, steam kettle, thimbles, pins, needles, thread, material and accessories. Ella said with a smile to match her father's. Not much then, Thomas said as he scratched his head beneath his flat cap. I know where to get them from, but it won't be cheap. And my wages have to cover the rent and our food as well as gas and fuel, Ella said. We'll manage, Thomas replied. Don't forget, I'll have two stoppages out of my money too. Ella's smile slid from her face as she remembered her errors at the shop. Bloody woman, Thomas grumbled. Everybody makes the odd mistake. She shouldn't punish you for it. She should show you how to do it properly in the first place. Pig's trotter for tea, Ella asked, wanting to change the subject. What about you? Thomas asked. Oh, no thanks, Ella replied. I prefer leftovers. You don't know what's good for you, Thomas said with a smile as he saw his girl wrinkle her nose. Busying herself with their meal, Ella said, I get my wages tomorrow when I've got Sunday off. Thomas grunted as he sanded down the block, causing fine dust to fly when he blew on the wood. Ella sighed inwardly, realising how much more work she had still to do cleaning up Thomas's mess. Then, as she watched him concentrating, she thought, It doesn't matter. I'm just so pleased he's found something to do which makes him feel useful again. The following morning, Ivy handed Ella her wages. I have deducted the amount to cover the hats you ruined, she said curtly. Ella gasped as she opened the small brown envelope. You took ten shillings? Yes, there was nothing I could do to salvage that one hat, and I did warn you this would happen. Ivy stood ramrod straight, her hands folded at the front of her black skirts. I know, but... Ten shillings? How am I able to pay rent and feed us out of one pound? Ella's heart hammered in her chest at the prospect. You should have thought of that before and been more careful, Ivy snapped. I warn you now, any more errors and you'll be out. I'm sure there are many girls who would be eager to take your place. Turning on her heel, Ivy left Ella to think on what she'd said. Dropping onto her stool, Ella looked at the money. How could she explain this to her father? Would this paltry amount last them a week? Was there a way she could make it stretch until next Friday? Sighing loudly, Ella shoved the money into her drawstring bag. Turning to the counter, she picked up a large ostrich feather and stared at it. She wanted to crush it and slap it in Miss Gladwin's hand before telling her she could stick her job up her arse. But with a little giggle at the thought, Ella picked up her needle and began sewing the feather in place. All day, Ella worried about how to tell her father she had worked hard for a week for a single pound. How would he react? Would he be furious with her? Thomas had never been angry with her, as far as she could recall, but there was always a first time. She was dreading going home and, despite constantly checking the clock, the day seemed to fly past. Before she knew it, Ella was walking through the dark streets, the cold nipping at her nose. Clutching her bag as if it contained the crown jewels, she was afraid someone might steal her hard-earned money. It was all that stood between them and starvation. Increasing her pace, she rushed home to face the music. Ten bob, that's daylight bloody robbery! Thomas boomed after he had listened to what Ella had to say. I'm sorry, Dad, she said tearfully. It's not your fault, girl. It's that woman. She's a thieving mare. Thomas was furious, but not with Ella. His anger was directed at the woman who employed his child. Ella stifled a sob and Thomas held out his arms. Folded in the comfort of her dad's loving embrace, Ella allowed her tears to fall. Letting her cry out her misery, Thomas said, Right, tomorrow you go in there and tell Miss Gladwin you've quit. Dad, I can't. What will we do for money? She asked as she moved to sit at the table. You let me worry about that. When you've told her, you take ten bob of that pound and you go and get as much as you can from the haberdashery.
Dad, that money is for rent and food. Ella was shocked at the thought. Do as I say, sweetheart, because your old dad has a plan. Thomas grinned as he tapped the side of his nose. What plan? Ella asked suspiciously. You and me, we're going into the hat business. Thomas nodded to the pupae he'd made for his daughter that day. Ella sucked in a breath. She'd been so worried about the cash flow problem, she hadn't noticed it sitting on the table. Stroking the padded head, she breathed. It's beautiful, Dad. Then she asked. What happens if we can't sell any hats? How will we live with no money coming in? Where will we sell from? I have it all worked out, Thomas said. But it will mean hard work for you in the beginning. Are you up for giving it a go? Ella hesitated. Were her skills good enough to produce items to be sold? She must be. She'd made hats for Miss Gladwin, albeit for only a couple of years. However, they were still sitting in the shop waiting to be sold. Was that because they were not a high enough standard of work? No. Ella believed it was due to their being fashionable years ago and people wanting more up-to-date designs. Thinking hard about the proposal her father had put to her, Ella knew she had to grasp the bull by the horns and make it work, for both their sakes. Yes, she said eventually. Seeing her father all fired up was reason enough for Ella to agree to embark on their new adventure together. You can't just walk out, Ivy said the following morning when Ella said she was leaving. I can and I will, Ella said still standing in her outdoor clothing. What will I do for an assistant? Ivy said pitifully. You should have thought of that before, said Ella, using the phrase Ivy had spoken the previous day. Before what? Ivy demanded to know. You have been rude to me ever since I began working here. You took my idea and passed it off as your own. Seeing Ivy Blanche, Ella went on. I heard you tell that customer exactly what I had said to you regarding that riding hat. Then, to top it all, you stopped my money and, in my opinion, far too much. I had to cover my expenses, you stupid girl. Ivy spat nastily. I am not stupid. I understand about accounts, but to my mind that was excessive. In fact, it's tantamount to stealing. I wonder how the constabulary would view it. Ella said, raising her eyebrows. There won't be any need to. Ivy moved to the till and a second later held out her hand. Here, take this to help out as I know you have to feed your crippled father. Ivy handed over two half crowns. They both knew the money was not to ease Ella's situation at all, but was to cover the woman's duplicity. Ivy did not want the police on her doorstep because of her greed, she had known the stoppages were far too high, and what she hadn't reckoned on was the girls challenging it. Thank you, Ella said with a glare, but I'm still leaving. You said there would be plenty of girls who would be glad of my job. Good luck with that. I hope you find one. Goodbye, Miss Gladwin. Leaving the shop, Ella suddenly felt free. Filling her lungs with cold air, she did a twirl right there in the street much to the amusement of the passers-by. Five shillings better off now, Ella made her way to the drapers with a spring in her step. Taking her time to choose her materials, Ella formed images in her mind of the hats she would make. With everything she needed in a box tied with string, she set off for home. That afternoon, Ella and her father excitedly drew up plans for their new business. They sketched their ideas on brown paper begged from neighbours, and Ella couldn't wait to get started. Mr Potts from two houses up sent this old kettle, Thomas said as he lifted it from beside his wheelchair. That was nice of him. Could you find a way of tilting the lid and holding it in place for the steaming process? Yes, a bit of wire will do the trick, Thomas answered. His heart leapt with pleasure at being asked to find solutions to Ella's questions. Suddenly, Ella's hand covered her mouth for a second. Dad, how can we display what we make? Miss Gladwin had a window to show off her hats. Use the sitting room, Thomas answered simply. 
How? That's your bedroom now? I'll have to learn to climb the stairs again, won't I? Thomas responded, hoping his smile would ease his daughter's misgivings. Dad, it's not going to work. You can't manage the stairs, you know that. Ella saw their dreams melting away before her eyes. I have two strong arms and a backside. I'll manage. And how will you get down again? Ella asked. Same as I went up. Now stop fretting, because tomorrow Mrs Woolley is coming round to help you take my bed back to my proper bedroom. Thomas rubbed his hands together, and the gleam in his eyes shone bright. You have everything worked out, don't you? Ella asked. Thomas nodded. You know, Dad, I think this might actually work, Ella said with a laugh. What will? Sally asked as she stepped into the warm kitchen. Thomas explained about the business they were about to undertake, as Ella made tea for them all. Of course it won't work, Sally said at last with a shake of her head. Ella sighed loudly. No matter what she said, Sally would argue with it. Who is going to buy a hat from a dingy back street house when they can go to the big shops in Birmingham or London? Sally shrugged her shoulders. Why do you always do that? Ella asked. Sally raised her eyebrows in question. You frown on everything I do. Just for once can't you do something sisterly like say, well done for trying. Ella's temper was rising and it was all she could do to keep it in check. I was only stating my opinion, Sally replied, feigning hurt. Well, don't. No one asked you for it. Ella was fuming now. Girls, please, must you disagree about everything? Thomas gave a weary sigh. I can see I'm not wanted here, so I'll go home. Sally grabbed her hat and coat and slammed the kitchen door behind her as she left. Father and daughter released a long, drawn-out breath in relief. What if she's right, Dad? Only time will tell, but I have faith in you. Now, let's have our tea in peace and quiet. Thomas gave his daughter a cheeky grin as he nodded to her to lock the back door. Chapter 5 Two days of hard work resulted in a transformation Ella would never have thought possible. The sitting room was bright and clean, and the furniture moved back to its original place in the house. The windows sparkled, and in their bow stood pupils Thomas had fashioned for displaying the finished hats. While Stella had been busy cleaning, he had, with the help of a young lad who lived over the road, made himself a trolley of sorts. In exchange for a cake baked by Ella, the lad had scavenged all that was needed. A wooden seat with a backrest and two short sides had been attached to axles. Four old perambulator wheels were fixed in place. This was to be kept at the top of the stairs. Now Thomas had an easy way to get to his bedroom and his wheelchair could remain downstairs. In the evenings after supper, father and daughter worked together, their designs coming to life before their very eyes. You will have to decide on how much to ask for these, Thomas said one night. Oh, I hadn't thought, Ella replied. Start with your costings. Take into account what you spent on materials and frippery. How long it took you to make the article and a bit on top for profit, Thomas instructed. Ella blew out her cheeks. There was more to running a business than she had expected. You'll have to keep ledgers as well. Incoming, outgoing, order books and receipts for happy customers, as well as opening a bank account. When you're ready to open for business, you need a snippet in the paper telling folk who you are, what you do, and where you can be found. Thomas laid down the bow he had just finished and looked at his girl. Close your mouth, there's a steam train coming. Ella burst out laughing, then said, I'm worried about it, Dad. What happens if no one buys our hats? You'll go hungry. Seeing the shock on Ella's face, Thomas let out a belly laugh that ran around the small kitchen. Oh, Dad, it's so good to hear you laugh again, Ella said quietly. It feels good too, Thomas said, patting her hand. Ella watched as Thomas wheeled himself to the stairs door, which was held open by a metal hook and eye. With practised ease, he lowered himself onto the bottom step. Giving a little wave, he pulled himself up the stairs. Ella heard the trolley trundle along the short landing and she smiled. 
In a week, she had quit her job. Her father had found he was useful after all, and together they were starting up a business. Tonight, as every night now, Ella prayed that their new venture would be successful. Her eyes shot to the ceiling as she heard her father whistling a little ditty. It was something she hadn't heard in an age, since her mother had died, in fact. It lifted her heart and, as she banked the fire for the night in the sitting room to stave off the damp, she sang along to the tune. Dousing the lamps, Ella continued to sing as she made her way to bed. Thomas's laughter boomed out. We make a good pair, he called out. Like father, like daughter, Ella replied. Before long, the house was dark and quiet, and Ella thanked her lucky stars for having such a loving father. As Ella climbed into bed, her sister was doing the same over in Cross Street. Lying next to her snoring husband, Sally began to calculate. It had been four months since she'd seen her monthlies, which could mean only one thing. She was pregnant. Having said nothing to Eddie, she thought the time had come for him to know he was going to be a father. How would he take the news? Would he be pleased, or would he see it as a drain on their coffers? Whatever the outcome, he had to be told. To be truthful, Sally wasn't sure how she felt about it herself. A baby would take a lot of looking after, and it would be expensive. The idea of disturbed sleep filled her with dismay, for it was certain Eddie would not help with night feeds should the little one not take to the breast and need a bottle. Sally grimaced in the darkness.